So when you're ready, you can sit down. And it doesn't matter if you haven't meditated before, I will lead most of this meditation as I usually do over in Perth. And in other words, give you guidance. Just like when you're learning to drive a car, you have your instructor sitting right next to you, making sure you don't crash the car and kill everybody. So here we go. Very good. So you close your eyes and remember what I said this morning, this is Club Med East Morven branch. We're here to relax to the max. Take it easy. So we start with just how we're sitting. So, ask your legs, as if they were another person. Ask them, legs, how are you down there? Are you comfortable, legs? Do you need to be moved, adjusted? Because asking a question, you'll get an answer. It directs your awareness to that part of the body. Just like a doctor might say, just how you're feeling today. It makes you look and be aware of how you're feeling. Where does it hurt, the doctor asks. And it points your awareness and makes you describe it. So asking a question, a directed question, is a very helpful way of establishing some mindfulness. So you become aware of your, your feelings in your legs. How are you, legs? And then, adjusting them if necessary, just to assume that when you first sit down, your legs are comfortable. No, you can make them more comfortable. This is not just pampering your body. There is an essential training happening at the same time of awareness and some kindness. Aware of your legs and being kind to them. And I continue my awareness and adjusting, relaxing my legs until they feel very comfortable. I always notice, for me it's like a, like a tingle, like a feeling that these things that have like just been massaged or they've been You've just been in a hot bath and everything is just nice and loose and relaxed. It's a feeling of relaxation. And then once my legs have been attended to with kindness, then I ask my, my buttocks, my butt, how are you? Do you need to be adjusted? Because I do see people just fidgeting when they're meditating, and it's just because they haven't really paid attention to an insignificant part of their body, they feel, their butt. When you're sitting meditation, that butt has to be comfortable. So you find the best position for it. If you're going to fidget, now's the time to fidget. If you need a cushion underneath, fine, get that cushion. You can uh, push it away, push it towards you, to the left, to the right. It doesn't have to be balanced, but it has to feel good. And once I've attended to my own bottom, then I move up to my back. Now if you're sitting in a chair, it's quite okay to lean back and rest your back against the backrest if you think that's the best. You can move it forward to the left or right. 
if you're sitting down and you've got what we call the VIP seats in a temple which is against the wall, you can lean back against the wall if you need to or you can lean forward. How does your back feel? Often, at this stage, I like to give my back a stretch. And as I can see dogs and so many animals, they love just stretching their bodies. So I stretch my back and then I let it go, let it become loose. Because when you stretch the body, it's all these endorphins get released. They are pain inhibitors, immune helpers. It feels good. And I keep looking at my body, adjusting it here, adjusting it there. Especially now my back, until my back is pretty comfy. And I never always use the same position. Because sometimes you may be tired, so sometimes you may have to lean back, lean forward. You find out the optimum position for yourself. And then you notice your position of your hands. If the person next to you is snoring, you can always move your hand mindfully next to them, tap them on the shoulder. Well, I put my hands usually in my lap. And I just ask my hands, are you comfortable there? You develop awareness, you move it this way, move it that way, until you can find the optimum position. That's called kindness, care. And once my fingers and hands are in the best position, then I can relax them. I move up to my next part of my body, usually the shoulders. The shoulders are often the seat of great tension. So now, now I imagine my shoulder muscles to be these two, two bundles of strings on either side of the spine. And then I imagine those muscles being pulled tight at both ends, being stretched. That's what we call stress. And then I imagine just letting go of both ends of those bundle of strings called my shoulder muscles. Mindfulness allows me to have feedback. The information which mindfulness gives me changes. And I can feel whether that, those muscles are relaxing or whether they're tightening up. I'm becoming aware and learning how my own body works. And once my body is relaxed, it feels comfortable. So I just relax my own shoulders. And then move up to my neck. People have pains in the neck, even if they're not married. or they have irritations in their throat, people are coughing. So feel that irritation, get to know it. And experiment, find out what makes it worse, what makes it better. A little bit of kindness, letting it be, opening the door of your heart to this. Not rejecting anything. Just being, not being afraid of what's happening next. Just being in this moment, being kind. Being with those feelings in your throat rather than being against them. And if your mindfulness is strong enough, you'll be able to notice what makes those irritations worse or what makes them ease off. What makes them ease off is what we call kindness, letting it be, opening the door of your heart to that feeling. It actually gets less irritating. 
And lastly, I invite people to become aware of the sensations in your face, especially around the eyes and the mouth, maybe the forehead. Because a person's emotions can be seen in the way that their face is configured. Especially around the eyes and the mouth. Aware of those muscles, how tight they are. See if you can loosen them. Just letting it go. Awareness allows you to gather the data and you soon find how to relax things. So your whole face feels loose, the body relaxed. And once the body is relaxed, now see if you can go to one part of the body, the most irritating part of your body right now. Because sometimes that's deep inside. It could be a wound which hasn't healed yet. It could be indigestion or some other pain inside of you. If you can feel that pain inside of you, that irritation, the most disturbing part of your own body, which you cannot really alleviate through adjusting posture, just zoom in on it, focus in on it, And once you have as much awareness as possible of the most irritating, painful, diseased part of your body, then see if you can notice what eases the pain or what makes it worse. Usually you will find the same ways you relax your body Things like letting it be, kindness, open the door of your heart, can relax the pain inside of you so much, even if it's a tummy ache, a food poisoning, kidney stone, you can feel that and relax the pain away. Mindfulness gives you that ability to get feedback. You learn about your own body. At the end of my body awareness, I usually try and become aware of the whole body just sitting here. So relaxed, it's like it's been soaked in a hot tub. And it's a delightful feeling when you have a relaxed body. I get to know, I recognize that delightful feeling of bodily relaxation and comfort. And I indulge in it. Indulging in that pleasurable feeling will make you more relaxed. I enjoy the feeling of relaxation at this stage of the meditation. And then I turn to my mind, my emotional world. And I begin by asking myself a simple question. It arouses mindfulness of the right area. I ask myself, how peaceful am I right now? And give it a number from one to ten. One means really peaceful. Ten means quite agitated. And be honest about it. No one's going to, to be able to judge you. They won't hear. How peaceful or how agitated are you? All this means is you're becoming aware of what I call the peaceometer that part of your mind from which you can get the information what makes you peaceful, what disturbs you. Straight away you should be able to notice 
that whenever you drag up the past, that moves the needle of the peaceometer further up to the number 10, it disturbs you, it gives you business to do. Whenever you worry about the future, that also disturbs you. When you just let go of the past and the future, realizing that now is where your future is being made anyway. Now is the only time you'll ever have. You find in this moment, the needle of the peaceometer goes down, become more peaceful. And just like sending your mind out into the future, out into the past, sometimes here in the BSV, there are children outside, the sounds outside. If you send your mind out to those sounds, it's like sending your mind out to the future or the past. You just get disturbed. <coughs> so you can imagine sitting in a bubble. Imagine you're in a cave. You can hear the sounds of the world outside. But you keep your senses inside. All that stuff outside is none your business. Nanya. Now just focus on your peaceometer. What makes it more peaceful? What makes it agitated? The more peaceful you get, the more delightful it is. <coughs> Peace is a very wonderful form of happiness. And after a little while, it happens naturally, you become aware of your breathing. Because the breath is always moving. As the body relaxes and the mind lets go of its business, only then can it quite happily and easily be aware of the breath. So just breathing in, breathing out naturally. And as you breathe in, imagine you're breathing in peace, health, freedom, anything positive. Imagine breathing it in with every in-breath. And every time you breathe out, breathe out, let go. Let go of any sickness, tiredness, negativity. Breathing in peace and breathe out, let go. Breathing in peace and breathe out, let go. Breathing in peace. Breathing out, let go.
Be aware of the breath going in and going out. Not controlling the mind, remembering, it's like putting down the cup, not holding it, not driving the vehicle of meditation, but being a passenger, just aware and letting be, breathing in peace, breathing out, let go.
getting close to the end of the meditation now. How do you feel? How relaxed is your body? How peaceful, how content is your mind? And how delightful is it to be rested and at peace? To be free of tension and tightness, not worried about the future or the past, because right now it's pleasant. gong three times to end the meditation. Please listen to every sound of the gong. And only when the third ringing vanishes, only then to open your eyes. Nice and easy. <coughs> so, hopefully you. Oh, oh, have you got some more complaints from the internet? Questions? haven't come out of meditation yet. Maybe some questions. Anyone, does anyone have some questions here after the meditation? Yes, the, from over there straight away. Is it pass, see, just pass it along. Pass the back, yes. Over to the corner over there. Hello, Ajahn. Hello. You? Um, I have a question about depression. Yes. Um, a daughter of a friend is only 12 years old and mm -hmm. um, has been diagnosed with depression. Mm -hmm. um, do you, have you ever encountered people with depression and um, dealt with how uh, help them dealing with depression? And oh, of course, yeah. Many different things. Obviously, to find out if it's a 12-year-old, of course, sometimes it could be being bullied at school. Sometimes it's not being praised enough at home. Because sometimes I've, oh, years ago, instead of actually being driven around in people's cars, sometimes I'd love taking public transport. And because they can get much more information. So I remember coming back from a, uh, a talk and being in a, a, a bus and just being behind two teenage kids, about 13 or 14. I always remember their conversation, obviously the best friends. I remember how best friends would talk to one another. And they said, you know, you're too flat-chested, you'll never find a boyfriend. But your nose is too big, you'll never find one anyway. And these were two best friends talking to one another on the way home. And it carried on like that for about 20 minutes until they got off at their bus stop. And I, I remember that even as a kid, when you go through those years of puberty, people get so critical, the competition between friends is so great. And so they get criticized by their, their friends, their best friends. And at school, the teacher, you can always do better. 
you're only second in the class. Come on, you can get top. And at home, the parents always pointing out the kids' fault. You know, tidy up your room. You know, just do some more homework. Don't spend so much time on the video games. Don't do this. And if you actually listen very carefully, notice how what children hear. What 11-year-old hears? She hears from her teachers, her friends, her parents. She's not good enough. And it's wonderful to understand just where some of that depression comes from. And we need to praise more. For people at school to actually, ah, oh, you're not top of the class, like I used to say, when I was a school teacher, there was one kid. He was, oh, I must be about 13, I think. He came bottom of the class in, in my maths class. No, I shouldn't know, it's actually the whole, the whole, uh, the general class score. 30 kids in a class, he came bottom, 30th. I had to give out the report cards. At the end of the year, do they still do report cards these days? Take home to you? They do, okay. So I had to sort of give out the report cards, and this boy, he came bottom of the class at 30. Now, of course, if that was a special school with every kid was Einstein, of course, you know, one would have to be sort of the worst Einstein in the class. <laughs> so just because you come bottom doesn't very mean very much. And so, so I saw him as soon as he got his, his report and opened it up. You see his face drop. His shoulders hunched. She knew he'd done badly, but not didn't think that bad. He got depressed, and you didn't need to read his mind to figure out what he was thinking. What are my friends going to say? Dummy, you're a dummy. You came bottom of the class. What are my parents going to say? They're going to take away so many privileges. You've got to work harder next year. I'm not going to have my kid come bottom of the class. So he needed some support, immediate. And they all knew I was a Buddhist when I was. Uh, at school, when I was teaching. So I went up to him and said, you come bottom of the class? Yes, sir. And I said, congratulations. <laughs> they knew I was a bit weird. <laughs> and I said, I'm very proud of you because in Buddhism, we have something we call the Bodhisattva. And a Bodhisattva is someone who sacrifices their own well-being and happiness for the sake of others. Now all your friends over there, they've just been thinking about themselves. They've been trying to do well in the, the exams because they're just so conceited and selfish. Only you think of other people. I know that you're very smart. You have deliberately, on purpose, decided to take this terrible place at the bottom of the class so none of your friends will have to suffer the suffering and the pain of what you're going to get tonight from your, ki from your parents. <laughs> it's a wonderful sacrifice you've made, on purpose. And so, as soon as this class is finished, I said, I'm going to go to the principal and I'm going to recommend you for the Bodhisattva of the Year Prize in this school. <laughs> Because you weren't concerned about your own score, you're making sure that other people did well. And he looked at me, I remember his smile, as if, what teacher have I got in this class? It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> then he started laughing. He just broke the smell of depression. And I, just to top it off, I told him that in this school you're only allowed to get the, bo the Bodhisattva prize once. So please let your other friends get the prize next year <laughs> and don't become the bottom of the class. All it was, it was just so changing this, this judgment which makes people feel depressed. They're losing out, they're not good enough, there's something wrong with them. So that's one of the first things with, with depression. Sometimes it can be something physical. Oh, get them out of there doing some, some sport or some games or something. Later on, you know, one of the wonderful ways of overcoming depression, which very few people talk about, is actually doing some, some social service. Community work. Get them out to some, come and join the BSV kids group, or the, the youth group, or just volunteer for you know, whatever is, is needed in the community. Because actually when you go out and help others, volunteer work, you get so much 
uh, reward back. You don't look for money, but you feel good about yourself. You're with people, you're helping, you're doing a service, you're making something bigger than yourself. So doing social work is a wonderful way of overcoming depression, getting a little bit past it. There's obviously meditation as well. And sometimes it could be some even easy things, just, you know, pampering yourself, having your favorite food. Because when you get your favorite food, you sort of tend to think, oh yeah, you get a bit of happiness and energy. The deeper ways of overcoming depression, of course, are just uh, not fighting this world so much, not being so angry. Because see the, the connection between we struggle so hard for acceptance or getting by or doing well, what we think is well. We struggle so hard and we put forth so much energy in our life, after a time we get frustrated. And from frustrating we give up. What's the point? Try so hard and no one appreciates us. I really put my effort in and nobody sort of says thank you. Those sorts of things, they just take away your motivation, which is part of depression. What's the point? So some of that is some ways to overcome, or just some techniques to overcome depression. Of course there are some depressions which you know, do respond really, really well, especially if they're very acute depressions. Uh, that's with uh, some medication. But you know, once you know, you've got past the acute depression, eh, just see if we can get a bit more praise, a bit more encouragement, especially in life. Praise goes a long way. So I always say here that in the BSV, if ever there's something which I say which really impresses you, please say thank you to me. Anything which I say is wrong or which you want to complain about, go to the management. <laughs> <laughs> Pass the buck, but keep the dice. Hi, Ajahn. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, I grew up believing, uh, related to the previous question, I grew up believing that uh, if we want to achieve something, we have to push ourselves a bit more of our comfort zone. But uh, up to this point, I'm actually a bit confused. Uh, when should I stop then? Uh, uh, as a mom, sometimes I'm confused if, if let's say, I don't cook tonight. Uh, Am I being too selfish, or have I take all my responsibilities as a mom? Uh, yeah, what should, what do you think best practical things like? Uh, when do you think it's time to stop? To Thank stop you. now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best time to stop. But no, it's uh, because it's a conflict between your own needs and the needs of others and especially in a family, or in a, a Buddhist society, in a community. And that is answered by the anecdote, start with an anecdote which many of you know, and then just to expand from that, that you know, Mahayana and Hinayana, which are the best vehicles. And in a marriage, Sometimes one partner is Hinayana and the other one is Mahayana. <laughs> one is selfish, and <laughs> well, they can get out of this, and the other one is always giving. And both are wrong. Both are just, you know, just uh, <laughs> not very helpful. So, usually when I do marriage blessings, I have great fun with this, and amazing how many people keep forgetting this. I look at one of the, the, uh, the partners, say the bride first of all, look her straight in the eye and say, you are now a married woman, you're a wife. From this moment on I want you never to think of yourself. And she nods. It's amazing, just, especially when they're married, they listen to anything. <laughs> and the marriage ceremony, they really pay attention. She nods. And then I look to the husband, especially, I know this is stereotyping, but this is just my experience, okay? Look at the Australian man getting married. They say, 
from this moment on, you shouldn't think of yourself. You're a married man now. And he always pauses. <laughs> he hesitates. But usually, after a little while, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I stood looking at the guy, and I said, now you're a married man, from this moment on, you must never think of her, your wife. Don't think of her anymore. And then, while he's worrying about what I'm trying to get at, I look at the wife and say, same with you, from this moment on, you're a married woman, you must never think of your husband. And it's a wonderful moment when people just they're trying to figure out what it's meant. <laughs> and then, sort of I give them the, it's not the punchline, but the, the meaning of the riddle. I said, once you're married, you must never think of yourself. That's selfishness. What point of a marriage is that? That's Hinayana. When you're married, you must not think of your partner. That's self-sacrifice. You get burnt out after a while. There's nothing in it for you. So he said, in a marriage, the solution is never think of yourself, never think of your partner, you only think of us. Third option, us. You're in it together. You're a team. It's not about me, not about you, it's always about us. So that's in the same in a family. In a family, it's not about you sacrificing or you giving all the time, just doing your duties. You're part of the family. It's about each one of us. So when you change that perspective to being about us, not about me, not about them, it changes the whole ball game. You do need some, some time off as well. You need some downtime, some rest. It's not always about giving. Because if you give too much, you get burnt out, you get sick, you can't help anybody. You count. Not more than other people, not less than other people. You're in it together. Or just the five fingers in the hand. If one of these fingers gets sick, if one of these fingers gets infected, I can't use the whole hand. So that's why all the fingers have to look after one another. So the big the thumb has to look after the little finger. The middle finger has to look after the little finger. Because if one gets hurt, the whole hand gets unusable. Same in the family. So it's learning how to work together. And that means having some rest. And of course, having some rest means being efficient. I was when I was in Hong Kong recently, same in Sri Lanka. I always make sort of silly jokes. But I was saying that, you know, in the years ago, the British Empire would sort of control India and Sri Lanka and Hong Kong and now it's in Malaysia. Now it's lost all of those and what was the reason why? And I think my, my uh, explanation why the British lost their empire is because they stopped having tea breaks in the morning and the afternoon. Because <laughs> we were famous for tea. Tea break in the morning, tea break in the afternoon. And as soon as they stopped those, it meant they worked right through, which meant they got stressed out and they made too many mistakes. So even today in Australia, you know, people tell me that they used to have what they call smoko in the morning. S smoking break in the morning, smoking break, but then they stopped smoking because it's bad for your health. But they abandoned the break as well. So if you take a break in the morning and a break in the afternoon, what it means is you relax, you rest, you recharge, and you finally become far more efficient. Your brain can work much better when it doesn't work continuously. Even in AFL, do they just you know, play right the way through two hours of football without a break? You can't do that. Even in soccer, it's 90 minutes. They have 10 minute half time in between. In cricket, they have a lunch break and a tea break. It's very refined. Because you can, but in the office, 
work right the way through. Lunch time, yeah, you're eating and still on a computer as you're trying to eat something. No wonder people get stressed and why we get inefficient, why we make too many mistakes, we get so stressed. The problem is, is we don't know how to relax. And we think, but we got deadlines, we got to complete the work. Yes, but you find you get far more work done of higher quality if you take breaks. You're a far better soccer player if you half time you take a break. At school, you have recess, call it playtime in the morning, playtime in the afternoon, and lunch hour, or half an hour, 45 minutes or something. Why do they do that? Because it's much better for your brain. You can learn better. You can produce more. So, one stupid reason, one of the reasons why the British did become very successful is because of their tea breaks. As soon as that stopped, that was the end. <laughs> That's my social theory of the demise of an empire. Working too hard. Do you reckon I can get a PhD on that? <laughs> okay, take a break. Okay. That's only a joke, of course. But there's some truth to it. I we are to. going to have a tea break at three o'clock. Yay! Okay. Um, so, dear Ajahn Brahm, I'm 28. 28, that's a month? You, you, <laughs> you have to use your imagination. No, I'm, um, no, it says, I'm 28, I'm afraid of marriage. A lot of my peers have a short term mindset and I have seen high divorce rates in the modern world. Why even bother? Yeah, On the other right. hand, we talked before and we both agreed that this phase of my, at this phase of my life I may not be ready for ordination. Should I just have a house and five dogs for the rest of this life? <laughs> wow, that sounds attractive. Yeah. Because dogs are actually so easy. I mean, dogs never argue at you. You know, sometimes you come home late and they're just, just so happy to see you, they just wag their tail. Yeah. And so they never argue, you can feed them whatever. And so they will eat it. Even if it's cold food, hot food, and just dogs are so happy. And just, they're always happy just to look after you. Imagine, imagine getting a husband like that. He's always just happy to see you. He never complains what he feed him. <laughs> I shouldn't say things like that. <laughs> well, there's something to say about that. You know, that some, some of the dogs, well, the dogs don't need a cup of coffee in the morning to wake up. <laughs> they, can, they can sleep anywhere, dogs. You know, sometimes, you know, your wife you needs a special bed here, a special bed there, and just still can't go to sleep at night. It's amazing, dogs. Just the way they can just cut up anywhere, no worries in the world, and just have a nice rest. That's why one of my disciples in Perth a long time ago, Australian guy, he said, when I, when I die, I want to be reborn as a dog in my next life. <laughs> he said that to me. I never heard that before, because in Asia, I mean, being reborn as a dog, what do you want to be reborn as a dog for? Supposed to be a lower form of existence, but he said, "Actually, Brown, think about it. Come on, use your, your intelligence." He said, "Look, a dog, a dog doesn't have to go to work on a Monday morning. Dogs don't have to go to school and do homework <laughs> and do tests and do nap plan or whatever it is. The dogs just sleep around all day. And all the, the only work a dog has to do, you know, is to take you for a walk in the morning." You don't take the dog for a walk, the dog takes you for a walk. <laughs> and just a wag its tail, lick you sometimes, and the rest of the day it just sleeps in a nice warm corner. You know, sometimes, you know, just sometimes the way we work so hard, it would be wonderful just to find a nice corner to sleep in. And <laughs> the dogs, they can eat, and they get free health care, that'll worry about a thing. 
So he said, yeah, well, in my next life I want to be a dog. So don't have any stress at all, just relax all day, sleep all day, eat nice food, go for a little walk and that's it. And that's what I told him, he said, well, this is Australia. In Australia, I don't know how many weeks after the dog is born, they have to go to the vet to get desexed. <laughs> and that's when he changed his mind. <laughs> He said, I don't want to be important as a dog. I never thought about that. <laughs> but just, so, but anyway, so again, to, if you do want to, to get married and have that sort of commitment, it does change it a lot as long as you do it the right way, for the right reasons. So sometimes that it's peer pressure sometimes, or rather, Mother pressure. You, you've got to get married. When are you going to get married? Come on. But if it happens, fine. But if it doesn't happen, fine, yeah. So this is where we sort of make our choice, what we need to do in life, what we want to do in life. But if it is that marriage, again, just be careful. Because sometimes just people just... I tell this to young, young men and young women, I told this first of all over in Singapore and I said, look guys, girls, if you want to get married to someone, just be sensible about it. My first piece of advice for the girls in Singapore, never ever marry a rich boy, a boy from a wealthy family. Because if you marry a husband who's really, really wealthy in Singapore or Malaysia, you know, what happens afterwards is many of them get mistresses. <laughs> that is what they, what they do. So, you know, you may be able to, you know, go off to a meditation retreat, sort of in Australia, and you're always worried, you know, it's like my, 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 my husband seems so happy that I'm going on a retreat. <laughs> I wonder what's going on. <laughs> but if you marry a poor guy, he can't afford a mistress. So you're perfectly safe. You can go on a meditation retreat, you can go spend a week with your friends. He's so poor, you've got no worries at all. You know, the no money, no honey thing in Singapore. <laughs> so true. But, so first of all, girls marry a poor guy. And guys marry an ugly girl. <laughs> Never marry a beautiful girl, because if you have a beautiful girl and you marry her, then of course you may go off, you know, to volunteer for the weekend and the BS fee. And but you know, she's so beautiful, all these other guys are looking at her, you'd always be jealous. You never know. But if you know an ugly girl, you know, she's so grateful that someone's married her <laughs> and no one else will be looking at her. And you'd have this wonderful relationship. He's not marrying you because you're hot, marrying you because he loves you. So it's this wonderful thing. It is it's obvious to me, guys marry ugly girls, girls marry poor men. And then you live happily ever after. Doesn't it make sense? <laughs> so all you girls who still haven't found a partner yet, it's because you just dress up and just go to the beauty parlor, go to the ugly parlor. <laughs> go to the, you know, the Salvation Army or whatever, and Vincent's the pause and get the old clothes. And guys, if you want a nice girl, a nice marriage, sort of, you know, if you are already rich, you give it to the Newbury Buddhist Monastery Building Project. And when you're poor, then you can find a happy marriage. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> no, in other words, you know, just check out, you know, before you commit to someone. And just, uh, it's not just uh, marrying for, what are you marrying for? I find it's, you know, you really do have a commitment together. Much more than just the lust, but something you have an understanding together, it's just you want to live a life together. That's why it's wonderful if people meet together and they meet together, say, you know, if it's in a sort of a place like a Buddhist monastery or Buddhist, Buddhist temple, and they've got the same ideas together, the same aspirations, and they want to sort of uh, live together. And, and honestly, this is true that not all monks, you know, survivors monks, some disrobe, 
But all the monks which I've trained, the men I've trained who actually do disrobe, they make these incredible good husbands. The wives actually tell me, said, thank you so much for training my husband before I married him. Because <laughs> they're, they're so sensitive, they, they have to work in the kitchen as an anigara because they learn how to cook. <laughs> and they learn how to clean up after them and wash up and just be sensitive and do chores around the, the temple. And you know, after two or three years of living as a monk in Bodhinyana Monastery, oh, they are just so highly trained, sort of husband material. <laughs> the people that actually come and tell me, said, whenever one of the monks is you know, thinking of going, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but it's true, you know. They just have some happy marriages afterwards. Anyway, so what are the things? I, can I ask a question? I'm going to ask to see how intelligent you are. Why is it you can never see elephants hiding in trees? No, why? Why can you never see elephants hiding in trees? Now, I'll leave that with you and answer this question first of all to give you a chance to figure out the right answer. Yeah, at the back, yeah? Hi, Arjun. Um, just wondering what's the Buddhist view on euthanasia, especially if you've got a chronic issue? Yeah, no, look, it's not euthanasia is not the problem, it's youth all over the world. <laughs> youth in Asia. <laughs> That's what you read it, wasn't it? <laughs> now, it's for euthanasia, it, the first person who ever had legal uh, assisted, uh, assisted euthanasia was a Mr. Dent. He was a Buddhist from Darwin. He was Dent. Yeah, he was a Buddhist from Darwin. And uh, I never saw him, but actually Ajahn Yanadama went to visit him when he did some treatment over in Royal Perth Hospital in Perth. And he told me all about it. What was his reason? And he had a very degenerative disease with no possibility of any cure. Could last for years and years and years. And uh, the reason why he took that voluntary euthanasia was to free his wife. His wife was giving him 24-7 care. We'd, we'd sometimes wanted to have respite, but she always felt that she was the one responsible. She had to look after her husband. Even when she had a holiday, she was worrying about him all the time. And he said that he could cope with his illness, but the one thing which he couldn't cope with was the fact that the woman he loved and committed to had no life for herself. And so he did that to free his wife. Now you may argue with that, you may disagree with that, but to me that's a valid decision. I may not sort of decide that that's the reason to, to take my own life, but he decided it was. And so for that, you know, you can say that in those cases that one should be allowed to actually to make that choice. With all those, and of course, since that time, I've seen many, many cases. Oh, no, please. The doctors have been saying for years, palliative care, palliative care. But I haven't, they said that, but I haven't seen the action done. There's just too many people I've seen really suffering in hospitals. Another Buddhist I saw who told me he was, he was really, really sick. And he said, can't you just take me out the back and shoot me out of compassion? Just suffering so much. And even worse than that, I remember seeing my mother over in a dementia ward. She was fine, so well looked after. But there was a couple of, of patients with chronic dementia, extreme dementia. Physically, they were so well looked after. But every moment they were waking up, not knowing where they were, who they were, or where they were. And I, I've experienced you know, just a, a tiny, tiny taste of that. Because I go traveling, you wake up in the morning, like even this morning, I've been in that room many times at BSV, as soon as you wake up, where am I? And sometimes, until you turn on the light, oh, I'm in the BSV this morning. Until you turn on the light and you get your, your bearings, then you feel safe. But I can imagine someone who every moment just wakes up, they don't know where they are, who they are, whether they're with friends or with enemies, what's going on. And I saw these two women in the same ward where my uh, mother was before she passed away. 
they were in total terror every moment of their life because they could not remember know who they were, where they were, whether it was safe or not. And it's the only way to overcome that would be to just to put them under such heavy sedation they wouldn't have a life anyway. So there are extreme cases. And of course every time there is a, a, a survey done, it's usually about 80% of people in Australia, they want that option for euthanasia. They call voluntary assisted euthanasia, where you make your choice. That's against putting someone down. In other words, you making that choice. And that's obviously because you can't stand to tolerate somebody else's suffering. It has to be a personal choice. If you decide that's what you want to do. And in Buddhism, there's nothing wrong with that. That first piece of parnati pata, not killing, that's killing another person. It's not regarded as if you take responsibility for yourself and do it to yourself. If you're in the right frame of mind. But anyway, to put you also out of your misery, the answer to that riddle. Why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? And the answer is because they're so good at hiding. Hiding. Yeah, they can't because they're so clever at hiding. That's why you never see them up there. <laughs> Come on, think about it. It's like the U.S. government who brought the state-of-the-art camouflage trucks. They brought these camouflage trucks, so camouflaged that they couldn't find where they parked them. 